Hello and welcome to He's Dropping at the Movies. I'm Mike. And I'm Jose. And today we've seen Venom, Let There Be Carnage. Yes. The sequel to Venom from a couple of years ago that I think we were quite surprised that we quite liked, although you were just saying you saw the premiere on TV recently on Channel 4. Yes, it was playing on Channel 4 last night and I saw the first 15 minutes and it just looked horrible and I don't know if it was the small screen or, you know, because I had, I mean... I didn't think that the first, we, neither of us thought that the first film was any good, but it was very enjoyable and it was enjoyable in interesting ways Yeah, that caught our attention. Yeah, there was no like greatness to it, but yeah. it was a lot more fun than, well, particularly the critics at the time said, and it was, it was a real emblem of the critics said one thing and the audience said another. Yes, and you know, my experience of it was that, you know, it was great fun and I loved the internal monologues and actually I found it quite funny. Uh, and so on. So it had a lot of little attractions, yeah, that kind of uh, mm. gave pleasure. But they weren't evident, you know, in my brief uh, viewing of the film. I mean, it's exactly the kind of film that I would normally let play out on television. And, you know, when you're mm. tired and you, you've, you're familiar with something, and just let it mm. play on and re-enjoy it. And actually, I just did. I turned it off. So um, I don't think that set my mood for this. But I actually, I found this one particularly, like, unenjoyable. I found it like a real endurance test. Right. I mean, you know, it's, I, I responded to some of it. I laughed a few times. Mm-hmm. But um, I think it's really poor and crude. I thought it betrays the actors, actually. It was very interesting to look up Andy Sorkin and see... Andy Circus. Circus. And uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's an actor. And I thought he did really poorly by his actors, uh, the way they were photographed and their performances. You know, uh, the, uh, Woody Harrelson looked terrible. Uh, Michelle Williams looked terrible. You know, they. I don't know. I don't know if it was the wig or, you know, the, uh, the paleness of their skin or the way that they looked like they'd been Botox but not quite. There was, there, you know, they just didn't look good. It's not a pretty film, generally. No. Um, I did find myself thinking I would quite like to turn the lights on. Uh, you know, it, it is kind of visually dull and dark pretty much throughout. And there are, the scenes in the police station reminded me of Saw. Remember the last one we saw? Mm. And not in a good way. I mean, like, the thing about Saw is it does look ugly and these are badly lit and dank. Um... I didn't like that. I had, I had trouble with the humour because it is full of attempts at jokes, and a lot of them, some of them work. Yeah. Some of them really work, and I did laugh at things. But there, are, there's a thing where it's just, for some reason, things don't work. So there is this playoff between Venom, who is stuck inside Eddie's body, mm. and Eddie, um, and there's like an odd couple or whatever. And the first one had that too, and that's like, that's like key to the film, and, and they play off each other comedically. And you can see how the idea is there in the, in various scenes. So there's the one, for instance, where they find out that Michelle Williams, the, the ex, um, is now engaged to Dan, the other guy. And Eddie's upset about it, and Venom decides he's going to take on the task of cheering him up, and so mm. he makes him breakfast, and it's chaos. You've got Eddie sitting down, looking despondent, while these arms are coming out of his back, causing chaos in the kitchen you can see the idea is there but it's just not working it's not working and it's not working because there's nothing to contrast it with all of the film is on that coarse brutish destructive level there isn't a moment of calm or beauty or you know something that lets you know what is being lost through this destruction Mm. i mean the apartment of uh i forget what the hardy uh eddie eddie brock eddie you know, Eddie's apartment is always a piece of shit, right? <laughs> so, you know, when something gets destroyed, you actually, yeah, it's just, mm. you know, adding to the look. And actually, I thought... <laughs> but maybe that's kind of part... He does he does clean it up after... A, yeah, you know. but it, it never... Yeah. yeah. Because I think there was something about the destructiveness that is a recurring theme in my view of American cinema. Mm-hmm. That, you know, kind of things get destroyed without any consideration of... Uh, a moral weight that they might carry, right? Mm. Uh, And that is true of the film as a whole. So even when people are eaten as a joke, you think, you know, kind of there's something wrong with that, really. Yeah, like, and I I think in the first film, I didn't quite feel that, but this now happens in such a recurring way that I, I, I felt, you know, there's something 
not, it's not amoral about the film, mm. but that it never gets the distinctions between right and wrong right. Yeah, so you mm. never know kind of where you are or what's unfolding or what's at stake and what's unfolding. It's very, very, very crude filmmaking on every level. Uh, there's something else which I wondered whether you might bring up, but it certainly was on my mind, which is the English cast. Ah. Um, Tom Hardy already has the role, right? Yes. So, Because we talked about this before, English stars American cinema. Yes. The thing that really struck me here, and this is why I said to you, I just want to look up if it was shot in England, and it partially was, mm. um, and if it had anything to do with COVID, because I thought, oh, maybe they got to England, then COVID hit, they had to cast English people, mm. which is not the case. It was shot before COVID. Um, so that's no excuse. Um, but you've got... Uh, Tom Hardy already has the main role, so that's you know, one thing. Michelle Williams and Woody Harrelson, Americans. Yes. Then you've got Naomi Harris, English. Stephen Graham, English. Reece Shearsmith, which really surprised me, because, okay, it's a small role, he plays his priest at the end, but it's it's a nothing of a role, and he's not someone who has any presence in America, from what I understand, mm. right? Like, Stephen Graham is at least in Hollywood, even if he can't do the accent to save his life, and I thought mm. that when we saw him in the... Um, Scorsese film, we saw him mm. on, I forget, uh, uh, the Netflix one. Oh, I know which one you mean, like, something like The Immigrant or something like that. I can't remember what it was called, but uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's in that. And, the and, one with Robert De Niro and Al Pacino, yeah? Yes, and, um, you know, and I like him very much as an actor, but he just can't do an American accent, and, and it baffles me as to why he keeps getting asked to do one, and you do have all these scenes in this where it's, you know, an English person opposite an English person talking in American accents. And meant to all be in San Francisco. yeah. Because here's the other thing. We saw the trailer for the new Spider-Man film before it, which is Spider-Man, played by Tom Holland, who's English, mm. with Doctor Strange, played by Benedict Cumberbatch, who's English. Yes. Right. So again, same thing, and that kind of put me in mind to notice this when we saw Venom. And the thing with that is you're casting... St- well, but Tom Holland's probably not a star until Spider-Man, but certainly Cumberbatch was from Sherlock. You're casting stars, so... Although there is definitely this argument to be had about why are these English actors having these roles mm. the, of Americans, ideally they have a star persona that you, you're selling the film on them. Same with Tom Hardy. Mm. That's not the case with Stephen Graham. It's not the case with Reece Shearsmith. It's baffling as to why they are showing up here. And actually, it, it, I, I struggled with that. Actually, it's just lazy. I mean, I'm sure you know um, they were just Tom Hardy's friends. Or something like that. I, the whole film, <laughs> English to me, director as well, Andy Serkis, who was ter- who I think is also poorly a, a very poorly directed film. I was reading Michael Ondaatje. Uh, I don't know if that's how you pronounce his name, but he's got a wonderful book of a conversation with Walter Murch, the director mm. and editor, and you know who who redid Touch of Evil, um, and who did Apocalypse Now and the conversation, all those classic nineteen seventies films. He edited them. Mm. You know, and he talks about what editing is and, you know, and trying to find the structure and how, you know, it's partly intuition. Yeah. And you do these subtle things like, you know, he mentions this thing in The Godfather where uh, the Al Pacino character tells Diane, the Diane Keaton character, no, you can't come mm. to, you know, uh, with me to this. Uh, it's a family thing. And how, you know, part of this lodging or making the whole thing uncomfortable is just this edit, this cut, which... You know, so Al Pacino's arms are on the table in one moment and, you know, they're hidden under the table in another. And, mm. you know, how he cut it that way just to create a sense of dislocation, of discomfort, of, you know, something is not right. Mm. Yeah. You get the feeling that none of that kind of thinking has <laughs> taken place on any aspect of this film. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it's basically, it's, it's a director who's not, doesn't come across as a visual thinker. No. You know? Someone who thinks in terms of composition and what would be funny or what would be interesting or what would be beautiful. There's a there's that one shot where uh, Woody Harrelson, the murderer, goes back to Naomi Harris, his girlfriend, breaks her out of prison, and there's a shot of them from the side with one on the one end of mm. frame, one on the other end of frame. It's there for half a second. It's like the only interesting, the only well-composed shot in the film, you hardly see it. Um, although I must say, did I did actually like what it goes into, which is uh, he's got this new symbiote inside him, and it crushes the box that she's kept in, and as it crushes it, you go in for the kiss. You know, that was, that I thought was, it was quite effective. Yeah. Although it could have been shot better. It could have been shot better. It could have been made more important, more symbolic, more poetic. Yeah. Right, because the thing is that the the script, I think, has a lot of interesting ideas. Yeah, but none of them are fleshed out. You know, so. You know, the idea that these are like two discarded children 
who find each other and who are the only mm. anchor in the world that they have uh, created. I mean, you know, that's an interesting thing. It could have been developed and unfolded in kind of really interesting ways, yeah. right? Well, generally, the idea of symbiosis, it connects to the idea of having to latch onto someone to survive. Yes. And that's kind of there. It was there to some degree in the first one with uh, Tom Hardy and Michelle Williams and the relationship breaking up and will he survive it? And, you know, so w- whenever anyone has a relationship in these two films, it's kind of invoked to yes. some degree. Um, I also didn't like... So, so I think it's an incompetent film. Yeah, with an underdeveloped screenplay directed by someone who's not a very good director and who certainly doesn't seem to have much of a visual sense. But I also didn't like the way that the film didn't cater to just basic audience pleasures. And, you know, so part of the pleasure is in the performers, right? And, and you know, I'm not that shallow. It's also in the performances and what people do. And I think none of them are very well directed. I think Michelle Williams is wasted. And I think, frankly, if I were Woody Harrelson, I'd be angry, right? Because he's a brilliant actor, right? And he's not filmed very well. He looks atrocious. Uh, You know, so um, now Tom Hardy's a different thing because he's the star. He's the one that carries the film, Mm. right? And actually, uh, like in the first film, there should have been a moment, you know, where you see you know, him looking great and then what he's reduced to or what happens to him. You know, there's no reason for him to look as terrible as he does throughout. I mean, you know, in every shot, he looks like he's gotten out of bed. I know he's meant to be depressive and, yeah, in a Mm -hmm. difficult moment and so on, you know, but he's the film star, right? Like, you can act those things without kind of looking as badly as he does in this. Mm. And I love him, right? But, yeah, I thought even that basic pleasure of giving the audience the star is not handled properly. Yeah. I There's one shot of Woody Harrelson as well, which I almost laughed at how bad it was, which was where Eddie wants to see him before... Uh, uh, he wants to see Eddie before he's killed and see, he goes around to see him and he's in that like white mini prison cell. Mm. And the camera tracks around to see him and then it stops with the bar just on his face. Mm. I thought, you can't frame this just half an inch over... <laughs> It was bizarre that they, that they got... That, well, they didn't get away with it, because I noticed it, but I mean, that they f- didn't seem to notice it. I think it's particularly incompetent, because it is based on a comic book, and the thing that you know comic books teach everyone is about composition, and about effective and impactful composition, right? Like, yeah. visually, kind of every panel has to convey, yeah, kind of something in the story, and contribute to a feeling or a meaning, and part of the way that it does so is just through composition. It's... You know how it grabs your attention, and yeah, yeah. Uh, and this is a film that does not know the meaning of the word, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <absolutely. laughs> so uh, you know. With that said, there were things that I enjoyed, or at least I kind of felt myself being pulled along, kind of fairly amiably throughout the film. Um, I do think the kind of relationship between Tom Hardy and himself works uh, fairly well, although you know it sometimes struggles to find to get that momentum and i think the plot um it, it's feels quite aimless early on but i sort of didn't mind the feeling it eventually it'll figure out where somewhere to go um, um i didn't mind kind of being around the film if you see what i mean well okay to say i hated it is too strong but i did find it a bit of an endurance test mm. um and the things that i liked about it what i liked most there was that uh, animated interlude, right? Kind of recounting a bit of the past of uh, Carnage and Woody Harrelson. Yeah, Woody Harrelson's character and also Naomi Harris's character, mm-hmm. right? And I I love that bit of telling of animated telling, except you then had the faces of Woody Harrelson and Tom Hardy superimposed in it mm. the way that I sometimes do, you know, when my office isn't clean and you don't want people to see it and you're coming in and out of the Teams or Zoom meeting, right? Like yeah. I, I thought it was like so it was cheap. It was awful. Right? It was like, you know, this is a $110 million film and they can't even get that right. <laughs> yeah, um, I noticed that too. Um, speaking of Carnage, because Carnage is the name of this new villain and he's born from Venom and blah, blah, blah. Part of the question for me is, where is the carnage? 
says in the title, Let There Be Carnage. I'm thinking, this is going to be great, comic booky. The whole thing is Venom wants to bite people's heads off. He's The whole opening of the film, he's sick and tired of eating chickens, he needs human brains, and, and Eddie Brock won't let him eat them. It's not the rules, right? And then Carnage emerges in Woody Harrelson, and as soon as he does, he's got someone in his grip, and he's going to bite his head off. I'm thinking, great, it's going to be the difference between two of them. He will bite someone's mm. head off. He won't obey any rules, right? And before he does... The alarm goes off and he's sensitive to sound so he doesn't get to bite his head off. And that's the film stopping that happening, right? Mm. And there are so many occasions in which this is the case. Violence happens just off screen or in a very quickly edited or uh, kind of half half scene or far away shot that you don't really get to see it. Mm. That actually, I want... You know, it, it speaks of... It speaks of a studio thing of going, This we have to get the right rating for this mm. if we bite someone's head off. Eventually, he does finally bite... Um, Cletus' head off, Woody Harrelson, because he goes, the final villain, we've got the demon out of him, we get to bite his head off. And that happens off screen, it just goes below frame, and then you see Woody Harrelson's body. Yeah, the you, whole film is so badly that, thought through. That's a, uh, I don't think it's a case of being badly thought through. That's That, to me, speaks of a decision to not show this. Well, and actually, if, if it's cartoony, why can't you get away with it? Why why, why are you so scared of, the, of your own... Well, because the director doesn't know how to handle tone. Um, but also, you know... This thing that you're bringing up about Carnage, you have to have a before and after. And actually, even before Carnage comes in, the whole world is Carnage. It's all destruction and things getting destroyed and fights. And, you know, like yeah, I said earlier, there isn't a moment of calm or something better. I mean, one of the things that I think, you know, the film is missing is kind of a utopian dimension behind the carnage right so if carnage is the world of this film and it's so terrible what are you fighting for what kind of you know what would a world in which there was no carnage look like mm. you know the film never gives you an idea of of it really no. so you know there's no before there's no after there's no ideal to the kind of the present situation it's it's just junk and actually uh, the main thrust of the story is pretty badly handled from my perspective because it's about this cletus this this Obviously, you know him from the comic books, but I don't really. And I was aware he would be showing up because he was in a post credit scene or whatever. Mm. You knew Woody Harrelson was going to be showing up. Um, but you should properly explain to the audience, you know, this this guy's history, why he's on death row, blah, blah, blah. I, just, I don't think it really is. And there's a basic geometry to plotting, and particularly in a film like this, where you think everybody should be each other's doppelganger, right? So you have Venom and you have Carnage. You have Eddie and you have Venom. Right, like you have to create all of those relationships, and you have the Michelle Williams character, and you have the Naomi Harris character, and they should be connecting with each other in some way, right? And actually, all of those relationships, I think, are missed out. There's like a whole potential just in the geometry of the plot, yeah, and the the potential for doubling and kind of giving away or, or conveying information and feeling, yeah, through the juxtaposition of equal opposites that the film misses out on entirely. Mm. Someone started some drilling. Yes. <laughs> uh, I mean that that may that may be a good place to end. I'm not sure I've got too much to say about it. It's just not it's not a very good film. It's junk. You know, it sucks. It's, you know, because I wanted it to be good. I wanted it to be fun. I wanted it to have people's heads being bitten off. I wanted all of that. It sucks that it doesn't have enough of that sense of fun, excitement. Yeah, it's abandoned. not scary. It's not suspenseful. It's not exciting, and it's not. Uh, it's it's. It's very mildly funny. So let's say 10% of the jokes land. Yeah. Which is a very poor score. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, they're all right when they land. But I just wish more. Anyway. Yeah. There you go. It's a shame because I did enjoy the first one. But I may well, may well find, as you did, that if you go back and revisit it, actually, it's um, rather lacking. Mm. And the question is, did I enjoy the first one or was it good? You know. No, no. I think we were, we were both... Well, from my memory, I think we were both clear on that. We enjoyed it. Mm. Yeah, I think yeah. saying that it was good but it's, a whole, I, it's other... a whole other story. Yeah. Um, but this one was neither good nor enjoyable. And actually, it was, it's kind of offensive. I found it rather offensive, like just how inept it is, you know? Mm. I mean, this is a $110 million, uh, dollar, which seems like a kind of a vanity project, actually. It's just really inept. Um yeah, it, it was surprising to see Tom Hardy's name on the story credit at the end. Yes. You know, it's like, like you feel like something may have gone wrong <laughs> when well, when the actor's doing the story. Remember when Daniel Craig was on story credits for Quantum of Solace? You feel like 
feel like there's maybe it feels like that. It can't be like that because it's Sony and it's huge and they're not in any trouble. But it has that feeling of why, what, in what dire straits are you where the actors have got involved in the story? I think for me, you know, the reason why I say it's a vanity project, it's not, it wasn't because of the screenwriting or anything, mm. though I thought that was very poor. It was more the way that the Tom Hardy character was both written and filmed that you think of as some kind of projection of who Tom Hardy wants to be seen to be. Yeah. He wants to be seen as a slob. Yeah, as a kind of, you know, romantic slob, you know, (laughs) struggling with himself. I mean, it's a very romantic idea, right? Mm, But Um, not execution. Yeah, but not not well executed and, you know, very self incredibly self indulgent, yeah. Mm. And 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 uncaring of audience expectations in what is after all a genre film in which genre expectations are crucial. Mm. So uh that's it for us. We are eavesdropping at the movies and we are on. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, uh Audible, Spotify, SoundCloud and YouTube on social media. We're on Facebook and Twitter, and the website is eavesdropping at the movies dot com. Say goodbye. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs>